to today's lecture for those that are tuned in. Uh, if you log into a Google account, you can actually interact in the chat. Um, there's about like a 15 second delay, but if you have any questions at any given time, you can feel free to type something in, but you have to be logged in to Google, to a Google account in order for it to show up. Uh, I think that's just to prevent anonymous people from being jerks. Anyways, this is the makeup lesson for today's canceled classes. Uh, this will be lesson five. Uh, I think originally the plan was to talk about conics, but uh, I believe we still need to work on planes and lines in 3D. Uh, I believe most instructors are about the same place, so it should satisfy everyone's need. <clears throat> so without further ado, let's start with a little bit of review. So, <clears throat> let's start with a review of creating lines. So, given a vector, let's just make something up, and a point. There's uh, one question we can ask is find a line that's parallel to the vector passing through the point. So the classic constructor for that, keeping in mind that all lines or curves have to be parameterized. Use the vector as the coefficient for t. In fact, let me back up a little bit there. for each of the x, y, and z direction. So you'll see that we use the vector as the coefficient of t for each of these. Way to keep that in mind is that vectors generally give you a general sense of direction so when the vector says 2, negative 1, 5, it's saying you move two directions in the x, negative 1 unit in the y, and 5 units in the z direction. So those become the slope in the line equation for each of the x, the y, and the z direction. Of course, if you plug t equals 0 in right now, you get x, y, z is equal to 0. So that doesn't guarantee that this line goes to the point, but at least we have a line that's parallel to the given vector. So to make that work for our point, we just shift everything over to our point. By adding one, subtracting two, and adding zero, to each of the x, y, and z. So that when we plug t equals zero, x will be one, y is negative two, and z is zero, which matches with our point. So anytime you're asked to construct a line in 3D, you'll be always looking for two things, a vector that it's parallel to and a point that it passes through. Moving on to a plane. Let's, instead of a parallel vector, let's give this, call this a normal vector. The construction of a plane is kind of similar. Um, in the line ex example, we use the vector as coefficients for t. In the plane example, we use these as coefficients for x, y, and z. So the way I always start with these problems is once I have my normal vector, construct the coefficients. always equals zero. Then use your point to shift it over. So we're going to subtract one from the x. It does the opposite of what you think it might do. That actually shifts it to the right one. 
shifts it in the y direction, negative two units. And then we don't really need to put this part, but I'll put it just for illustrative purposes, subtract zero from the z coordinate. That will shift our plane over to pass through the point one, negative two, zero. If I don't shift the point, and I just have the vector as coefficients, that does give me a plane with the same normal vector, but it will, all I know is that it passes through the point zero, 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 it won't necessarily pass through the point one, negative two, zero. So just a brief recap of how to construct planes and lines in 3D. So you should hopefully have seen that already. If not, here it is. Okay, the, the real questions um, that come up from this is, how do we get those vectors and those points? And so there's various different types of questions that can lead us to that. And one of the classic examples is if you're given three points. So let's say we're given three points. Let's do P is one, negative two, three. Q is maybe zero, one, one. And R is two, negative three, five. So you're given three points and you're asked to find the equation of the plane containing these three points. So the first question you should probably ask is there, that even that's always exists. So given three points, do you always get a plane? And the answer is yes, as long as they're not collinear. Collinear meaning all in a straight line. But given any three points that aren't along in the same line, you can always draw some sort of triangle, whether it's in 2D or 3D. And that triangle can represent just a little slice of the plane. And so what we want to do is find a normal vector to the plane. Because there's always the two things you need for a plane. The normal vector, or a vector that's orthogonal, and a point that it goes through, as we just illustrated in the previous example. So, we do have the point it goes through. In fact, we have three points that it goes through. So that part's already done for us. The part that remains is to get the normal vector to the plane. So keep in mind that normal vector means orthogonal. Something that should come to mind is cross product. Right? Cross product gives you orthogonal vector. So the idea here is that if we can create two vectors in the plane, if we can find two vectors or create two vectors in the plane, we can take their cross product and that will give me an orthogonal third vector that we'll, we will use as our normal vector. So let's see how we can get those two vectors. So we have these three points. Basically, each side of this triangle forms a, new, a vector. So we can pick any one of the, those three sides of that triangle to form a vector. I'm going to arbitrarily choose PQ, the vector from P to Q. And let's do Q to R. The way to get the point between the vector between two points is just to subtract the coordinates. So from P to Q, X goes from 1 to 0, which means that it reduces by 1. So the X coordinate would be negative 1. The Y coordinate goes from negative 2 to 1, which increases by 3. And then the Z, Z uh, component decreases by 2. Similarly for the vector QR, <clears throat> the x-coordinate increases by 2, decreases by negative 4 in the y, and increases by 4 in the z. So these two are the vectors that connect these points together. <clears throat> Use their cross product to create a 
normal vector. So this normal vector we're going to find now, there's many normal vectors, there's an infinite number, but this is just the most convenient one to use. We're going to take the cross product of PQ with QR. <coughs> Okay, I don't feel like doing this by hand. So let's you do it in Mathematica. If I can get it to work. So let's do this in Mathematica. And I'm going to do a couple things. I'm going to do the point as well as the um, create the vectors as well as do the cross product. So just illustratively, point and vectors in 3D are the same. So our point Q was 0, 1, 1. Now I'm subtract from that. The point P, 1, negative 2, 3. Let Mathematica do its magic. Negative 1, 3. Apparently I made a mistake. That should have been negative 2 in that previous screen. Fixed. Uh, the second vector would be from R to from Q to R, so I'm going to do 2, negative 3, 5, minus 0, 1, 1. So there's my two vectors that I got. Notice it's nice to do it in Mathematica so you don't make a simple mistake like I had just done. I know it's easy to subtract in your mind, but sometimes you make a mistake. <clears throat> And now we just want to take the cross product to get our normal vector. So in Mathematica, cross, and I'm just going to copy and paste. I'm going to copy and paste. I'm going to just retype it. And here's our normal vector, our cross product, 28, negative 2. So we have 20. 8, negative 2. And at this point, we have everything we need for the equation of the plane. I just realized that was off screen. I'm not sure you guys saw any of that. Uh, hold on one second. see if that comes up for a second. There we go. Sorry about that. So you see I subtracted the points in Mathematica, took the cross product 28, negative 2, and we end up with the normal vector. Okay. Got our normal vector and the point it goes through. In fact, we have three points. We can really choose any one we want. So I'm going to just go ahead and pick P, which was 1, negative 2, 3. We had our normal vector, which was 28, negative 2. And so just like the example we did earlier, given a normal vector and a point, we construct our... Uh, equation of the plane. So 28 and negative 2 form the coefficients of x, y, and z. And then we're
going to subtract our points from each of the coordinates. Like so. Oh, did I make a mistake? Uh, it's very possible. Let me go back. This is why I wish I could have copied and pasted it, but I guess in this online thing it doesn't work. Yes, yes I did. Thank you. So 4, 0, negative 2 instead. Which has changed the 20 to a 4. This actually just goes away. This will be 0. And then the negative 2 stays. Good catch. So in the end, you got, let me just simplify that a little bit, 4 times x minus 1 minus 2 times z minus 3. So there's the equation of our plane that passes those through, through those three points. If we want to check that it does indeed satisfy our three points, the easiest way to do that is to just plug our points into the equation we just created. If the points, if we successfully found the right plane that went through all three points and we plug the points in, we should get 0 equals 0, and we'll be good. So obviously, this point works because we just used it. If we plug in 1 for x and 3 for z, plug negative 2 in for y, but it's not there, it will just zero it out. So let's check the other points. In fact, let's do it in Mathematica. So the equation of the plane we just constructed was 4 x minus 1. plus, I'm just going to type it in anyway, 0 times y plus 2 minus 2 times z minus 3, double equals 0. So this is the equation of the plane in Mathematica. Notice I'm using double equals because it's an equation and not we're not assigning it a variable. So the command in Mathematica that you use to replace variables, I know you could do this by hand, but again, I want you guys to practice Mathematica as much as possible forward slash dot is the replacement command and in a set of curly braces you're going to give it a list of rules so my point q was 0 1 1 so I'm going to do x arrow 0 y gets replaced with 1 z gets replaced with 1 so again what that's doing is we have the equation of the plane We're doing the forward slash dot command that says replace. And then I give it the list of replacement rules. It says replace x with 0, y with 1, z with 1. And if I run that, it will plug those values into the equation. And what happened there, it says true. And the reason it says true is because what happened was the left side of the equation equals 0. The right side of the equation equals 0. They both equal 0. It satisfies the equation. Then I can just edit that line. Enter the other point of r, which was 2 negative 3 and 5 and again this will plug those values into my equation and what we should get is 0 equals 0 which Mathematica will interpret as the true statement so again it works so just a little verification that we did indeed find the equation of the plane passing through those three points if for some reason the, it did not work like if we plugged in the wrong points or we got the wrong thing when you evaluate it Okay, I forgot that actually doesn't matter what y is, so that's why that, one, that point also was on the plane. Um, but if I plug a point that's not in the plane, you, it'll say false, because what it's saying essentially is some number non-zero, say like 5 equals 0, which is a false statement. So that's a way you can check your work. Um, the thing I wanted to really point out here was this replacement command slash dot. We'll be using that in more complicated cases, um, so it's good to get introduced to the slash dot here rather than later. <clears throat> so, replace, and then here's your rules.
Okay, so that gets me the equation of the plane. Verify that it does indeed work in our equation. The three points satisfy the equation. Use Mathematica to prove it. Let's move on. All right, so let's say we're given two planes. Um, let's say we have 5x minus 3z equals 4. Let's, well, let's start with this one plane. Let's say I gave you this plane. Could you tell me what the normal vector was? Now keep in mind that we construct planes by taking the normal vector as the coefficients of the x, the y, and the z. We can read off the normal vector from the equation as well. Whatever the coefficient of the x, the y, and z is, is the normal vector. So the coefficient of x here is 5. The coefficient of y is 0. And the coefficient of z is negative 3. Okay. Here's another plane. Similarly, we can pull up the normal vector as just the coefficients. This one looks more like the standard format, whereas the other one didn't because it equaled 4 instead of 0. But they're both the planes, and we can read off from the coefficients that this has normal vector negative 10, 0, 6. So we can ask ourselves now, how, how, do these how do these planes relate to each other? Do they have any relation? Are they just two arbitrary planes, or do they have share some characteristic? And the thing that really defines the characteristic of the plane are these normal vectors. So if you recognize, these normal vectors are scalar multiples of each other. If I take the, the first normal vector and multiply by 2, negative 2, you'll get the other vector. And what that means is because these normal vectors are scalar multiples of each other, they must be parallel to each other. And if the normal vectors are parallel to each other, then the planes are parallel to each other. So kind of a visual representation of that is if I got one plane like this, and then this is my normal vector like that. That doesn't look too good. This is my normal vector. If I give you another normal vector anywhere, really long or really short, or even opposite direction, as long as the vectors are parallel and we're calling those normal vectors, the only plane we can draw is also has the same tilt or orientation as the original one. So all these planes we would consider parallel because the normal vectors are parallel. So the normal vectors really define sort of the characteristic of the plane and we, that's how we relate them to each other. So let's say we have these two planes, 5x minus 3z equals 4, and this is negative 10x minus 1, yada yada thing. And let's say we want to calculate the angle between the two planes. Well, these are parallel, so that wouldn't make sense. Let me give you two more a separate problems. So let's say we have 5x minus 3z equals 4, and 2x minus y plus z equals 5. And we want to know the angle between the planes. So these planes intersect in some manner. They're not parallel because they don't have the same normal vectors or they're not, the normal vectors aren't parallel themselves. So they must intersect at some sort of angle. So to find the angle, we just find the angle between the normal vectors. So again, this one had normal vector, let's call this normal vector 1, 5, 0, negative 3. And this one will have normal vector 2, negative 1, 1. And then if you recall, to find the angle between two vectors, we have a formula that says the cosine of the angle between the vectors is given by the dot product of the two vectors normalized. So then theta would be the inverse cosine.
Now people are like, why am I writing the hat symbol? Because that says it's a unit vector in the same direction, which means we normalized the vector, we made a unit length one. So going back to Mathematica. We want to take the arc cosine, so the inverse cosine of the two vectors normalized. So we're going to normalize the first vector. Take the dot product. There's more than one way to do dot product, but the easiest way is just to use a dot, period. Normalize the second vector. And that will give us some expression that I don't really understand. The easiest way to get an understandable answer to that, a numerical decimal, is to put a forward slash forward slash capital N at the end of the command. What that says is turn it into a decimal form. And we get approximately 1.05859. Now that is of course in radians, that's not degrees. If I want to convert it to uh, degrees, I can just multiply by 180 and divide by pi. There's more than one way to do that as well. And this is the way I'm used to, which tells us that there's roughly an angle of 60.65 degrees between the two planes. So close to pi thirds. We can visually check that if we do a contour plot 3D command. So I'm going to plot these two planes. Keep in mind that these two planes are 5x minus 3z equals 4, 2x minus y plus z equals 5. Let's do a contour plot, look at the planes, and check the angle. So contour plot, curly brace. We're going to make a list of equations. So here's my first plane equation, comma, second plane equation. Close it out. There's my list of equations I wanted to plot. Then I have to give it a range of values. So I'm just going to go ahead and arbitrarily choose negative 5 to 5 in each of the x, the y, in the z direction. It's hard to see that second plane, but it is there. Here's your two planes. And so if I rotate this around in such a way that I get sort of have a top-down view along the intersection, you can see that the angle between them, you can maybe guess, is roughly 60 degrees. Now, technically, there's two angles between them. 60 degrees, that's the acute angle, and 120 degrees as the obtuse angle. So 60 is here, 120 here. Which answer is the right answer? It's kind of arbitrary. You can say 60 or 120. They're both valid answers. Um, unless it specifies the acute angle, which I know Mathema uh, not Mathematica, WebAssign does specify sometimes. Um, it really doesn't matter whether you give one or the other. But that, those angles, 60 and 120. Angle of intersection. From there, we can ask another question, which is, what is the line of intersection? So if you look at where these two planes intersect, there is a line of intersection along this little crease. And we might want to try to describe the line of intersection. So as soon as someone says, find the equation of a line in 3D, two, you should know you have to find two things, a parallel vector and a point it goes through. Let's start with the vector. How do we find a vector that's parallel to this line? Well, keep in mind what line of intersection means, or what intersection means. Intersection, or line of intersection in this case, means we're looking for a line that's in both planes. So whatever vector describes the direction of the line, that vector should lie in both planes. And if the vector lies in both planes, so if the line lies in both planes, then it should be orthogonal to both of the normal vectors of the planes. So stew, stew on that for a second. You got two planes and their normal vectors are coming out at, at some sort of angle. 
uh, perpendicular orthogonally, right? So you got a vector coming out this way, maybe one coming out this way. Any vector in the plane must be orthogonal to the to, no, to a normal the normal vector. That's but the definition of a normal vector. So if I want to find a vector that's in both planes, it must be orthogonal to both normal vectors. Oh, orthogonal to both normal vectors again should trigger your memory that how do you find a vector that's orthogonal to two vectors? Cross product. So if we go back, here's our two planes, here's our two normal vectors. We're looking for something that's in both planes, which means it's orthogonal to both of these normal vectors, which means the cross product of these normal vectors is a vector that's in both planes. So again, in Mathematica, we can do that. Cross. There's a vector that's in both planes. So, n, oops, n1 cross n2 gives us the vector negative 3, negative 11, negative 5. That's the vector that's parallel to our line. So right off the bat, what I have so far is a vector that's parallel to the line. So we have negative 3, negative 11, negative 5. So right off the bat, we can start writing our parametric set of equations. x equals, y equals, z equals negative 3t, negative 11t, negative 5t. Okay, if we were to draw this line, we would see that it is indeed parallel at least to the line of intersection. The one piece we're missing is that it must make, we need to make sure that line goes through exactly our line of intersection. We need a point on this line. So going back to our graph, here is our line of intersection. Again, coming up through this V shape here. We have a line that's parallel to it going through the origin. Maybe it's over here, maybe it's over here, wherever the origin is. Maybe it's floating right above it. But it doesn't necessarily line up with our intersection. So when you have to find a point in both planes. The classic way to find a point that satisfies two equations is to solve the system of equations. So we have our two equations here. And lo and behold, Mathematica can do this for us. So if I do the solve command in Mathematica, put my list of equations, my two plane equations, and tell it to solve for x, y, and z, essentially I'm saying Here's two equations. Find any point that satisfies both. Solve the system of equations for the variables x, y, and z. Um, and for a little extra kick there, I'm going to make this last argument reals. What that does is guarantees that it only gives me real solutions to the problem. Hit shift enter. Notice what it gave me. Didn't give me a point, right? It gave me that y has to be negative 19 thirds plus 11x over 3, and z would have to be whatever it says. That makes sense, because if I ask Mathematica to say solve the system of equations, find what these two planes have in common, well, we know what these two planes have in common. Oops. We know what these two planes have in common. A whole line of points, right? There's an infinite number of solutions to what's in the intersection. So at this point, we can say, well, pick any value for x you want. Uh, 
and I'll just make x zero. So a little, little magic there. The percent symbol says take the last response, that's out 15 here, y arrow, z arrow. Replace, remember the replace command, x with zero. So it plugged x equals zero into these two equations to tell me what y and z are. So this is one point on the equation of our line. Which means now we can come back and say, okay, so my plus zero, that's what we chose for x, minus 19 thirds for y, and negative four thirds for z. Now we have guaranteed that this line goes through our line of intersection because we used a point that was in the intersection. We can visually verify that if we come back to Mathematica, do a parametric plot, 3D. We're going to enter our equation as a vector. So negative 3t was the x-coordinate. Negative 11t minus 19 thirds was the y. Negative 5t minus 4 thirds is the z. And if we plot that from, say, negative 5 to 5 on the t range, there's your line. I don't really know how it compares to our answer, so what I'm going to do now is combine the plots. So I'm going to do sh the show command is a way to combine multiple plots. So I'm going to show my line and my contour plot together. So I'm going to copy and paste show contour plot 3D, comma, parametric plot 3D. This will smush the two plots together and if everything works out we should see, you can kind of see it here, the line is going along the line of intersection. If I change it to a different color real quick, or even I made the line red. If you sort of rotate it around, get a good angle on it. Here's our two planes, here's our line of intersection going right down the crease. So a little bit of math magic there. Again, that command here is, we did our contour plot from earlier, that's this first one. Then I put a comma, then I had my parametric plot which I had to enter as vector notation. So my x my coordinate, my y, and my z give a range of t to plot from, and then I just added this plot style red for it to show up a little more. You can change it to whatever color you want. I just wanted something to pop. And this show command will smush these two plots together, these two images, so that you can see them overlap and see that indeed, yes, it, we did. It looks like at least we got the line of intersection. Now, if I left off that minus 19 thirds and minus 4 thirds, that last step, you will see that the line does indeed seem parallel to the line of intersection, but it's not in the right location, right? Because we, did, we didn't shift it over to the right location by subtracting the 19 thirds and 4 thirds. So that that shift is really important that make sure it lines up in the right place. You could actually technically, if you came up to that solve command, that we had earlier, and it gave us this list of rules. We could have replaced x with t. So let me run that command again, and then instead, do percent x t. That is actually parallel, except in fact that's the exact same line, just scaled up. Notice, it, notice the coefficients of t there, 11 thirds and 5 thirds. That's a scalar multiple of the coefficients we used. So you can actually use the solve command to construct your line of intersection as well. And just recognize that, hey, I can parameterize this by just letting x equal t. So 
So wait and check your work. <clears throat> All right. Let me scroll through the book real quick to make sure I haven't missed anything. That's about the gist of it. So throughout this course, we are be constructing lines and curves and planes. Um, and as soon as you see, again, as soon as you see a question that says find the equation of the plane or find the equation of the line, you should immediately think to yourself, oh, equation of a plane, I need a normal vector and a point. Equation of a line, I need a parallel vector and a point. And the construction is always the same. Now, finding those vectors and those points might take some effort, but you're, that's always sort of where you're going towards. So whether you have to use cross product or in the future, we'll be looking at tangent planes. So keep in mind from Calc 1, you had tangent lines to curves. Now we're going to look at tangent planes to 3D surfaces. And similarly to Calc 1, we're going to use the derivative to find the normal vector to the plane and construct our plane and all that. And that's just going to be kind of a theme throughout. So these are kind of like the fundamental, fundamental skills right now of, of Calc 3 is creating these lines and planes given the various information. Okay. Then let's move on to the conics with the remaining 16 minutes we have. But that essentially summarizes all the lines and plane stuff that we have. So if you have your book, you want to go to page 837. Let me see if I can find it here. So page 837, you should see this big cheat sheet of the different types of surfaces and what their equations look like. Now, if you look, just look at that chart on page 837, you probably have a little bit of information overload. So I'm going to try to break this down for a way which is a little bit more understandable. Um, but actually, before that, let me hit cylinders. So cylinders is not just this shape that we're used to seeing. The cylinder generally means take any sort of curve and extend it infinitely in another direction. So this is an example of a cylinder. This is a the one on the left is a circular cylinder, the one on the right, because it has a circle sort of cross section, the one on the right might be a sinusoidal cylinder. You could have a parabolic cylinder, in which case you have y equals x squared like this in 3D. Just, yeah, you get the idea. A cylinder generally just means that it's a single curve that's been extended in the third dimension. It's really easy to identify cylinders because there's always a variable missing. Put anything together, x squared, x to the 2y over 3 square root of, don't use z. Actually, let me use z. Let me erase that. z over the square root of z plus 1 plus z squared or something equals, I don't know, 0. As complicated as this might be, you're probably like thinking like, what the heck does this even look like? Who knows? But you notice that there's only two variables appearing. y is missing. And what that tells you, it doesn't really matter what y is, every single trace, if we slice through um, 
If we slice parallel to the x, z axis, we'll have the same shape and we'll create a cylinder shape. So if you're not convinced, we can come back to uh, Mathematica here. We can do a contour plot 3D. taken a while, probably because it's a really bizarre shape. I also entered it wrong, but whatever. <laughs> so it really got wonky there. Um, let's see if this makes it any better. So it's a really bizarre shape. This online Mathematica doesn't work as fast as probably what you guys have right now on your laptop. Okay, so not really sure what this shape looks like, but notice if we move this around into the a view that's parallel to the XZ plane, it's the same shape just extended infinitely, essentially along the Y axis. So we would call this a cylinder. It's not that it looks like a can, it's just cylinder generally means to take the same curve and extend it infinitely in one direction. Again, really easy to identify because in this equation there is no y variable. If I plot this in two dimensions as, x, as along the x and z axis, you'll see the exact same cross section you have here. So that's how to identify cylinders and try to figure out what kind of shape the cylinder is. So easy to identify. The harder stuff is all the conic stuff on page 837. <clears throat> so let me go through them one by one and hopefully explain how you identify them. So the first one was a, uh, called an ellipsoid. So let's see, x squared, or I'm just going to put numbers in here. 16 plus y squared over 9 plus z squared over 25 equals 1. Okay, the easiest way to identify these is to look at the x, y, z traces, which might not understand right now, but let me show you. If we cover up x squared equals 16, oops, okay, and we look, if we just cover up the x variable and see what's left, you should be able to recognize that it is an equation of ellipse. If you cover up the y, it's an equation of ellipse in the xz plane. Cover up the z, it's an equation of ellipse in the xy plane. So no matter which way we slice this, we always get an elliptical shape. So if you have an ellipse in each of the, each of the traces, so three ellipses essentially create the, the ellipsoid, which is the... Looks like an egg. Okay, so that's an ellipsoid. Each trace is an ellipse. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, moving on to the next one. Uh, let's go with the elliptic paraboloid, or just a paraboloid in general. 
you might have something like z over 5 equals x squared over 3 plus y squared. So do the same game. If I cover up the x, that's an equation of a paraboloid. z equals y squared in the zy trace. Cover up the y. In the xz trace, we have another paraboloid, a parabola. So it's two parabolas so far. Cover up the z, we get the equation of a circle or an ellipse. So we got two parabolas in an ellipse, creates an elliptic paraboloid. So we have two parabolas and it has an elliptical sort of shape to it. So three ellipses, ellipsoid, two parabolas and ellipse, elliptic paraboloid. All right, next one is the hyperbolic paraboloid. By the very name in and of itself, you might guess that it's a mix of hyperbolas and paraboloids. So we have something like z over 3 equals x squared over 4 minus this time. That's the difference between the last one, y squared over 9. Okay, same game here. Cover up the x, you get a problem. But notice that it is facing downwards because of the negative coefficient. Cover up the y, you get an upwards facing parabola. So we got two parabolas just like the elliptic parabola so far. Cover up the z, and it's not an ellipse this time. Because it's a subtraction between them, it's actually a hyperbola. So we have two parabolas going opposite ways in a hyperbola. So what does that look like? So one parabola going up one way. Another parabola going down the other way. And it's hard to draw a little bit here. I'll do my best. Here's the hyperbola cross section. And then the same down here, except the hyperbolas are going now the opposite way. So I don't know if you can quite tell what this looks like, but it looks like a horse saddle. This is what we call a saddle. This might look like a mountain pass, where you got a peak over here and a peak over here, and this is the pass between them. So next time you guys climb Eagle's Peak, how you climb up the right side of it, right? What you're really shooting for is not the mountain pass, but the hyperbolic paraboloid. You'll never look at mountains the same. So that would be the hyperbolic parabola, a mix of parabolas and hyperbolas. Now, according to page 837, there are three more shapes here, but really they're the same. Um, so let me explain. We have something like z squared equals x squared minus y squared. Now it's different from the last one because the z is squared. Sorry, right, screw that up. Z squared equals x squared plus y squared. It's not an ellipsoid because the z is on the wrong side of the equation. So again, let's play with that. Cover up the x. What do you get? It's not immediately clear, but if you move things around, you get z squared minus y squared equals 0, which is the hyperbola. Cover up the y, same thing. z squared minus x squared is another hyperbola. Cover up 
cover up the z, you have x squared plus y squared, which is ellipse. So you have two hyperbolas in an ellipse. And what that ends up creating is what's called a hyperboloid. So if you draw, let's see, basically it's, it's a double bowl. So it can either look like this, which is a hyperboloid of two sheets. It can look like this. Which is a hyperboloid of one sheet. Or it can look like this. Which is a cone. So the cone looks like a cone. The hyperboloid two sheets look like two suction cups that are mirror images of each other. And the hyperboloid of one sheet kind of looks like the Chinese finger trap thing that you put between your fingers and you stretch it apart. What makes a difference? How do you identify one or the other? It all depends on how it connects. Does it connect at a point, like on the cone? Does it not connect at all, like the hyperboloid of two sheets? Or does it connect as an ellipse? And the only way to tell which way it is, is to look at what that slice is through the middle. Does it give you just a point? Does it not give you anything at all? Is that undefined? Or just give an ellipse? So if we look at z squared equals x squared plus y squared, if you make z zero, you have x squared plus y squared equals zero, which there's only one point that satisfies that equation. That's why it connects at a point. If I add plus one here, when I plug z equals zero in, I get x squared plus y squared equals one, which gives me a circle. So that'd be a hyperboloid of one sheet. If I subtract one on the left side, and I plug z equals zero in, I get x squared plus y squared equals one, it equals negative one, which is not possible. You can't square two things, add them together, and get a negative number, at least not for real numbers. There is imaginary solutions, but they don't appear on real graphs. So that's how you check which type of conic it is, which quadric surface it is. So all you need to be able to do with section 12.6 is to be able to look at the equation and identify it as either hyperboloid of various different types of sheets. Right? So that would be hyperbolas mixed with ellipses. It could be a hyperbolic paraboloid, which is a mix of parabolas and hyperbolas, which looks like a saddle or mountain pass. You got a mix of parabolas and ellipses, which is a paraboloid. So this looks like a bowl. And you got a mix of ellipses that just creates an ellipse. Right, it looks very similar to a spherical equation. These numbers, 69 and 25, just sort of stretch it in one direction or the other, makes it longer in one direction or the other. I, we don't care that you know that in particular. You should be able to draw traces anyways. If I say plug z equals zero in, you should be able to draw the ellipse. Um, the main idea though behind 12.6 that we want you to walk away with is Given the equation, can you identify what type of shape it is? And can you visualize that in your mind? Or at least use mathematics to help you draw it out. If you can do that, then you're good with 12.6. So that catches us up. That's all about lines and planes. Um, so far, we got the different quadric surfaces and how to identify them. Next class, next lesson, we should be starting to dive into vector functions and doing integrals and derivatives on vector functions, arc length, and all that fun stuff. But until then, um, 
enjoy your your snow day we will see you in the following days take care